Yeah, ho. Dreamland excerpts. Ace combat turn. Jet setting turn. Wings of destruction turn. Just don't let me die. Prediction day, October the 21st, 2016. This dream takes place in year 0327 GC. Stands for the Great Cleanse. According to historians and scientists, the rapture happened in year 2028. It wasn't like anything anyone has ever predicted or seen in writing. A giant orb emerged from the sun on April 17th, 2028. This orb came out completely white, reported as a huge mass of unknown matter that floated to the halfway point between Earth and Mars. During its entire three-month trip, until it finally stopped, people were disappearing left and right. Then were being replaced by monsters of all kinds. I somehow got froze to death by one of the monsters that ended up being unthawed scientifically without a hitch in year 0312. Since then, I volunteered to go back into the military to help with whatever I could. Then somehow got sent to the Navy to be a fighter jet pilot. Want to read how that silly shit went? Well, here it go. On January the 1st, I avoid any festivities like I normally do because I'm awesome, but more so because I'm on duty and I always have to be prepared to leave the cockpit for battle. Leading into winter, dragons and wyverns have declared war on all terrains of North America. Canada and the United States are not safe while they continue to unleash high-octane dragons and wyverns to demolish our bases, devour our cattle, or decrease the already dwindling human population. Ever since the cleanse has started, monsters have helped with human population inflation by decreasing the amount by two-thirds. It's been a peaceful world between humans since to the point where all of them have banded together to create the humanoid treaty. I'm praised as one of the high humanoids because my abilities to absorb magic from the ether of the universe but maintaining a healthy fighter pilot career to save lives. I think about how the world has changed drastically so many times over then finally leaving my apartment to get to my base. My version in these dreams is the regular caramel chocolate skin tone with a lavender beard and red eyes. I have my battle scars from being with the suicide squad for my battalion. I've hit the eject button so many times and started freezing flame breath and protecting myself from ice breath. You'll think I was a god. But I have scars all along my limbs from close encounters of fangs and claws. I am now a brave heart with a reputation for protecting. My ambitions were killed a long time ago, but I'm still splendidly happy because my partners in the skies are my good friend, Everett Brown. Someone I was in the army with, Franco Battistella. Somehow my favorite actress, Bianca Lawson. And this Scandinavian guy who goes by Trenton Francis. We all get out of our cars at the same time after pulling up at the same time with the same kind of gear. It's routine for some odd reason. For five near death, a lot heroes to take care of themselves alone then take care of each other once we get on base. Our designated parking spots are the five facing the long pathway entrance into our base. Me, Franco, Bianca, Everett, and Trenton. We walk the same way and let Bianca in first every morning. But today is an action day, which is why we are all geared up. Other battalions are having difficulties with a swarm of dragons getting too close to Mount Rainier. So we, along with the other three squadrons, will fly from California all the way up the coast to keep the dragons from destroying so much. We stock our jets up, then mock it up while mocking each other with jets on a mighty quick flight. We eventually catch up to squad three, then have to slow it down to get in the proper attack sequence. There were 11 super dragons that survived out of 20 so far on their flight to Mount Rainier. They were so super they changed the atmosphere in a 7 mile radius to look like the skies, cloud, and the sun were purple. This meant that a psychic tribe of dragons were in the sky today. It shouldn't take long to dispose of them, but if they survive till sundown, Seattle and the surrounding might be gone. For some odd reason, the disappearances of many humans have also made nature a beacon of magical power while still holding its natural power. Mountains tend to hold great treasures Mountains tend to hold great treasures of energy that intensify dragons with intelligence, speed, might, and endurance. They've been absorbing these kinds of energies for decades, and then they successfully do it. 
Civilization is quickly dismantled if it's within range. No time for that today, no matter how much time we get to see how beautiful purple skies can be. It would be more beautiful to keep people from being burnt to a crisp. Jokes about my beard and the scenery filled our radio channel for a while till we started getting close to the battle. We could smell it because enough Dragon Bell smells like burning human flesh and nachos. Don't ask. Well, I'm going to tell you anyway, even though I'm not one to gossip. Dragons secretly eat as much cheese products as they eat flesh. They have their ways because dragons are very civilized too. Eventually, we see them. Eleven super dragons swooping in and out of clouds like they're more than 400 pound asses have wings of eternity. Trying to catch other fighter jets. But when the first squad finally broke contact, the other squadrons that were there first backed off to leave the cross river battalion to cross them out. We had the psychic blocking metalloids. We are the only battalion in the country with them. One by one the dragons were crossed out to either flee or actually get ripped apart by bullets. It was beautiful though. On the radar, their psychic waves looked like smoke was playing with the other jets. But to us, it looked like smoke disappearing yards before they got to the jet. One, two, three, then four. Twenty railguns dismantled one dragon or damaged another to make it land and start fleeing from the battlegrounds. Then the sky started turning back blue. Eventually, it returned blue as we were told our mission was a success. And that we could return to our base whenever we wanted. Whenever we wanted. Haven't heard that in a while. But then again, when I don't waste a jet, they give my squad a few days off. Granted, all of our belongings, passports, identification cards, and toiletries are back home. We still head to Russia. After all of the maintenance fueling, leaving our jets in a treaty hangar, my squad and I go on a little adventure. Every and his beautiful chocolate hair says we need to stay together, so we do. Franco and Trenton decide to go sightseeing and to say their blessings for victims of the latest debacle to Russia. Bianca meets up with a few people to visit a famous library. Everett and I accidentally get caught up in a scavenger hunt. Yes, we had a translator. But it was quite sad because Akutska has this huge area of residential properties that was a victim of the rapture. Locals turned it into a memorial and treasure for sore eyes. A scavenger hunt is specially there to honor everyone who happened to have beautiful aspects about their lives before they were taken. There were several beacons across a huge strip that were randomly placed, colored specifically and out of order for the scavenger hunt. We saw beautiful family portraits through windows at times, lovely gardens, lovely bikes, architecture that was splendid, and every time we got to a correct spot, we had to tell people through speaker systems to do certain things within the home that would award us our next clue. Everything we collected through the scavenger hunt we ended up keeping, then here came Franco and Trenton being lame as ever. I don't know how they got caught up in the scavenger hunt because it's been an hour since it started, yet they caught up to us then took a photo to send it to Bianca, who was in a library acting a silent fool with other pretty girls for an inopportune photo shoot. They bombarded our phones with pictures after pictures and told us this is how you model. We laughed then wasted a good 13 minutes pretending to be Russian to one of the girls. Then we wasted so much time. That little adventure was crazy stupid. I don't know why those things happened, but they were beautiful. Eventually we make it back to the states to follow our daily routines of jet maintenance, training, education on monsters, social life, and reminiscing about simpler times. Year 0327 was already shaping up to be a miracle already happening. Within January and February, until Valentine's Day came around, a swarm of wyverns started hustling down Canada in a huge line. All of them were in a huge line that started from the east all the way to the west. How on earth did they procreate so damn many without anyone picking up on it? They were all young wyverns too. Adult but young adult. It was a total of 350,000 of them from the first to the last. I do have to say that it was perfectly planned out that they didn't start forming the line until noon of Valentine's Day. Everyone in North America was wide awake and prepared for the worst since this was the biggest formation of wyverns since the beginning of the war. We wondered how period, then how they all came together, when did monsters portray so much camaraderie 
And is this the beginning of the end of our existence? Everyone in every base, even bases around the world, were preparing to send troops to our rescue. Within an hour, the battle had begun before my battalion could get up. We had to do something because the line had already moved and started causing damage. Nukes were already scheduled to blast off once they reached unmanned destroyed areas like Yellowknife, Churchill, and Edmonton, closest cities to the beacon that I saw on the map. That would mean three breaks in a line that we didn't have to focus on. We stroked their formation many times where we felt like they could do the most damage. Yet casualty reports had us losing many humans. Then within three hours, they were getting close to Yellowknife so we could dent their line for the first time. I'll spare the details to a full extent. I saw melting in a lot of ways. I saw the blood in the air. I smelled the fuel in the air and the cinnamon mixed in with the charcoal smell the wyverns have unfortunately blessed our climate with. After the first nuke, half of all of our troops were down as well as half of the line, but they still had numbers up on us. We don't have any weapons that are built to murder a line of wyverns like this. A commander had us push several wyvern in a certain direction to maximize casualties for the second nuke hit. More melting flesh filled the air as we kept defeating or destroying wyverns. As brave as we are, they kept flying forward while destroying more jets. Then our backup came from South America, Africa, and Asia. Never thought I could be more happy. Yet, because it was almost like the beginning of a doomsday, I had to think of something else. Bianca is a light wielder in this dream, and Trenton is a psychic wielder. With me being ice and the wyverns being prone to ice DNA, I tell them to do safe ejects so that our three jets land with the minimum amount of damage. We somehow latch onto a wyvern through skies that are deadly versions of fireworks to blind it, then control it in two ways. Trenton was telling it to return home while Bianca was creating visions, so it wouldn't fly like it's supposed to. I poison it with human DNA to at least start a bio epidemic. After I pulled my liquefied ice hands out of the back of his dome, we all descended slowly because we could all fly. Then ran back to our jets while Trenton ensured that the wyvern could listen to his orders and retreat. It didn't. It eventually turned back around so we had to do damage control so we could really control the damage. My squad injured it enough to make it actually retreat. On a radar at base, our commander thanked me for also placing a bug on a the wyvern. Then let us get back to the battle of the line. Right before the third nuke destination, we fought that detrimental line that had our cleanup crews go about to turn all of the dead wyverns into dust. Disintegrate right before our eyes while everyone cleaned their wounds, filled out damage reports, report their existence, and prepare funerals for their lost comrades. To clarify things, my squad is a suicide squad because last-ditch efforts to make a dent is what we are all about. We've done the poisoning before, but we can't understand how so many wyverns were produced off the radar, but how did they get off the radar to begin with? Intelligence had a field day with that, as well as being prepared to see if my little DNA poisoning stint will hold up to anything. We wouldn't know anything right now, but after successfully keeping them from wrecking a lot of Canada, we will come into a few months of silence compared to what just happened. June comes around the corner and Franco finally gets over the fact that he was one of the humans capsulized by ice during the rapture. He finally says goodbye to his past and meets a lady who we all kind of adore. I might be the only one that found her energy to be a bit risky. I didn't say much because in times like this we could all die at any given time. But it was a long seven years and then some for him. For me, I said goodbye to everything I made and said hello to everything that is. As soon as he said that, he said goodbye to everything. That's when a woman had great time to enter his life. Her name is Erin. Beautiful, dark-haired lady who was a Navy woman that worked in intelligence. She was moved over to our base from the East Coast a month ago, but when she reached Franco's range of sight, it was all life wrote. Bianca was like, I need a man now. We all laughed about it, cause it was fucking hilarious. She was talking about we need to find that Colin Minogue song, Love at First Sight. But I was saying we didn't have to take it there for her. Then Everett looked at me like I did something wrong. I did nothing wrong. I'm a lovely psychopath who goes against the grain like a wise monk. Don't hate. 
Then Trenton found the love of his life the next day. He wasn't even affected like the rest of us. He was born during the time of GC, but didn't have a problem with everyone born hundreds of years ago. Then Bianca said what she said the previous day. I need a man. Then like magic, she got a man the next day. Was it a holy trinity or something? I mean, I am not religious at all, but let me make sure I don't leave my apartment the next day. Which I did, but was still with Everett for some odd reason. We rarely have time to play new school video games, but we made time to. We spent that entire day with the other three's new lovers to be. Playing video games and making sure I don't leave the apartment or see the delivery men. I was hoping the entire time that no dragons or wyverns were sparking ridiculous battles. It was happily smooth for June the 13th. Didn't meet any new people to disrupt my life. When the end of July was nigh, dragons and wyverns decided to spark damage at the same time. On the west coast of Canada and the east coast of the states. No one was ready for it because the dragons brought out a new colossal. Out of the middle of the ocean. It was massively ridiculous. And if you could see how it rose out of the ocean slowly, you will understand that it was bigger than the state of Washington. I guess they have been working for five years or so. Using the skeletons of dead dragons to make a structure that looked more doomsday than Mortal Kombat excels ugly as roster. When it fully emerged, no one knew what to do other than let intelligence figure out a way to damage it, as if we were using Knights of Sidonia's systems. It was the same way over in Florida. We had weapons of galore spread out for many means of combat, but we were definitely not ready for what they could do. The huge colossals that looked completely different from each other, but functioned the same way, were about to eat and evaporate land. When it reached the shore of British Columbia, it simply started digging into the land, 10 miles at a time, with 4 miles it seemed. Because they seemed invulnerable, a huge chunk was missing from British Columbia, and the butt of Florida was gone. That took a few days to accomplish. I spent a lot of time in the air and almost bit the dust, literally one too many times. Then it was day four. We halved the Colossals because all of the treaty was in this battle. The friendly spirits turned warrior spirits all around the globe, unified humanity, and if you could have seen it on a world map, it was literally all of them making a straight line to help North America out. We lost more people than we've ever lost. It was a tragedy that kept happening. None of the heroes stopped. We did what we had to do to tear the machines apart. Then the machines finally stopped. All of their power seized. We didn't know what to expect, but we kept hammering away at the Colossals. Dragons started coming at us seriously, with flame breath almost from all directions, but something else started that we had no idea about. The huge white planet of an orb that came out of the sun started breaking apart in the middle, then created a ring around what seemed to look like a core of an apple. Scientists were worried about that. The military was worried about the dragons and the wyverns. Then the ultimate suicide mission came across our dashboards. We had to fly all the way to Alaska as quickly as possible. Mocking it up, we went to get five weapons. Magical types created five giant daggers of massive energy just for this occasion. Just for my squad. We were all prepared to leave the base with the weapons. It was beautiful. Once we attached them to the bottom of our fighter jets, the atmosphere changed around us. All we could see were colored sparkles and glitter rising around our windows. Even those daggers were five times bigger than our jets. They were only 15 pounds each. They were all glistening white, but to each of us, the colors over our windows were all different. Mine was azure. Everett's was gold. Bianca's was white. Franco's was dark blue. And Trenton's was green. We rose out of the hangar in a clockwise motion, then went into formation to enter mock mode so we can do what we were commanded. We all thought it was a suicide mission because it said we had to stab the Colossals with the daggers. As we flew into the Colossal and prepared to eject so close to it, we couldn't. It was the first time we couldn't eject. Bianca was the first one to go. Her scream was horrible, but there was no crash. It was ridiculous. Ridiculously beautiful, but painfully disgusting at the same time. Huge white gleams of light shined across the skies when she plummeted in, and the hole she created was a huge wound that looked like flesh was being squirted out. The huge mouths of the Colossal let out giant screams, then she emerged from the Colossal unscathed, 
We all started zipping in and out of the Colossal's machine until it was rendered completely lifeless and started falling apart in the giant emptiness it created. Victory. Finally. We had to take these magical daggers from British Columbia all the way to Florida as quickly as possible, but along the way we were followed by an Emperor level dragon. The types that are as big as the Eternal Dragon of DBZ. Just plain big ain't worth a damn. We haven't dodged this heavily since a few minutes ago, but it was already old. All of the battalion were swooping left and right while trying to maintain reasonable speed to get to Florida before the Colossal activates again. The others told us to fly higher and separate since it was coming for the magical daggers we had on our jets. This Golden Emperor Dragon was smart though. It wasn't connecting any of the dots but it wasn't giving up on destroying us. It was using its whiskers to get at my squad while the three others were playing dodge flight with it as well as trying to damage it. Then someone used the last ditch effort because the daggers were spellcrafted to deal with the Colossals. We couldn't use them against a non-machine like Entity. Until we heard someone from Squad 2 start chanting on the radio while losing mock speed so she doesn't bite the disc. Eventually my squad lost control and started flying in a perfect fake formation that made us start spinning drastically. We created a circle of blade and then cut the Emperor Dragon in half. Lucky we were over the unlucky region of Kansas City. Unfortunate for those home to that city, it was destroyed decades ago but the Golden Emperor body fell lifelessly to the blackened grounds. We all let out sighs of relief, then slowed down so Emily could catch back up and reverse the spell she was commanded to speak. Then the 20 of us stopped the Colossal that destroyed more than half of Florida. Like everyone else that played a role in this disgusting and traumatic battle, we were praised with accolades and trophies. We didn't like it so much because of all of the people that died. All of the warriors were solemn for a long time because it was the most gruesome day of the war yet. No one who protected the world was able to sleep for a month straight without a lot of help. The summer was just painful. July the 14th, my little brother's birthday, had another colossal show up while the Wyverns had one of their ultimates destroy a marine base in Texas. We didn't see that coming. The ultimate got away with her crimes, but the Colossal was taken care of quickly because of the magical daggers. We'll never forget that day because the ocean was orange for a long time because of the victory up north, but everyone was sad because of the hundreds of lives ripped away by the Wyvern Legion. July the 29th, I was undergoing surgery to repair my hernia again. When I came to... I learned that Everett was put in a coma because of a suicide squad mishap with a mission to protect New York. He stayed in that coma for two weeks and came out screaming my name. I know because I was dozing off next to his bed when my head dropped and hit his left forearm. I guess my inopportune head but magically woke him up. He started to tell when he learned what happened and it was his fifth jet to be dismantled. He wasted no time in getting back to fighting condition to the point. In 26 hours, he was back in the hangar to meet his new jet. August the 17th, an earthquake unearthed a secret dragon lair in the ruins of San Francisco. Because of that, 7,000 dragon eggs were broken. We saved millions of lives because of that decision. The words cold-blooded were never used so much. The following day, the dragons claimed defeat. The wyverns no longer had allies in this disgusting war, yet... They were adamant about destroying North America and taking it as their own now. That threat was taken ultimately serious, had every base in North America and South America on extreme alert. Because immediately after they said it, seven ultimate wyverns took flight with their legions to hit up the center states of America. The Cross River Battalion didn't get there in time. Seven bases, towns, and cities were destroyed until they magically disappeared in the ether of life. September the 1st, I was giving Bianca a foot massage, then a dragon lady showed up out of nowhere. Bianca brightened up because of her light energies, and I turned her to liquid ice ready to nitrogen a cheek. She had a message for us, but I recognized her energy. Bianca didn't believe me, but I knew it was Franco's dame. How on earth can a dragon lady turn into a full-fledged human? Granted, I had to do research, but some of the dragons are allies. Some aren't. On September the 12th, 
a commander in our battalion was assassinated, as well as a few other important heads. Bianca and I started researching this shit because it seemed tricky that, that what happened so close after meeting that dragon lady. I don't care how magically blue-green she was, it had her energy written all over the situation. Then the next time I saw her, I immediately froze her to death, then shattered her body. Everyone except for Bianca hated me. I was branded as a traitor and turncoat, jailed, humiliated, until the DNA results came back to prove that she was of dragon descent. Guess how I reacted? I bought several bottles of wine, went to Franco, made him chug an entire bottle, and said, I always knew you weren't to be Seality. Nasty the best <laughs> He laughed about it and thanked me. Then I thanked him for never saying anything as well as not visiting me in jail. He had to collect his faculties, especially when the DNA results came up. Then here came the rest of my squad talking about, we have to believe me more now. Well, fuck y'all then. Then Halloween came. The end of the wife runs plight came. It's a good thing no skeleton looking bad bird bastards can't humanize themselves. But it was ultimately scary seeing them at some random spots during Halloween. Seeming like they are purposely provoking fear randomly being alone in skeptical places around North America. Every soldier figured they were up to something because news outlets kept showing how they were sometimes flying outside of windows of skyscrapers at the wee hours of sundown times. Flying in open areas of the forest and between trees like they've never done before. Flying over monuments until sirens go off. Flying in the mouths of waterfalls. Flying over abandoned farms far away from actual cattle. The one that got me was when I woke up one morning and I heard flapping. Heavy flapping. But like a dumbass opened my blinds into a huge dark gray wyvern already on iceberg mode. I got shocked and dove out of the way as I got into liquor form. But I didn't hear flapping anymore. I was going to be late to work. So my squad said they'll wait a little while. Until I pull into base so we can uniformly part like we always have. Ultimate lameness for the ultimate day. On the 30s. We were just chilling in a conference room playing maximum cart days. Pushing each other off of cliffs. Knocking TNT around stages. And running each other over a hundred times. Franco starts talking shit about the wyvern that met me this morning. But how can they be so brave to be so deep in our civilization. When they all live at the North Pole. They are getting on my damn nerves though, because we get false alarms all the time and intelligence can't figure out what they are going to do and the means in which they want to do it. Then for the umpteenth time I say, I wish these hoes would go ahead and do what they want to do. Before anyone could laugh, the blare of a battle alarm went off and we were paged to come to the briefing room. Remember the white orb that broke to create a ring around an apple core like formation? It just instantly transformed to a human being hung. I guess the rapture isn't over. Must be a blue gender thing where the population hasn't been decreased enough. Yet the dragon stopped warring with us. But the formation of a huge W was seen over North America as the Marines were immediately dispatched to lay down infantry work. My battalion was waiting on commands as we weren't allowed to go prep our jets yet. We sat there for a good two hours watching damage reports that made the W seem a whole lot larger. Whatever the wyverns were doing was massive because three major cities had already fallen with this attack they had set up. They hadn't taken power from nature in a while. They weren't congregating massively before the attack. They were invisible sneaky little bastards about this and their powers were way too massive. The casualty count eventually hit 200,000 as we all felt like this would be the end. I wanted to know exactly what we did to these monsters to start this war but no one even knew that. I told everyone in the squads that we need to pull out all of our doomsday powers regardless of what commanders say. Then Bianca said we might as well just suit up and go since the white orb transformed to prove our doom. We did. Someone with cyber powers in another squad hacked the systems when we had his jet absorb his superpowers. The doomsday device way. All 20 of us went to the middle part of the W to finally see firsthand what was going on because there was no surveillance for some odd reason. What we saw was some of the most beautiful energy I've ever seen in my life. All of the wyverns were white, like radio feeds have been saying the entire time, but they weren't ugly wyverns. They were more slick, more angelic as if they were all spirits, which was proven because regular ammunition kept passing through them. But we weren't idiots. 
We all brought ammunition of all kinds. We equipped our plasma weapon scent, then started our doomsday devices again. The middle point of the W was gone. Then we broke off to kill at least 200 miles of the energy that was creating the W. Then we saw a huge set of eyes open up above the clouds with a nasty terraform showing itself. I was the first one to attempt to stop it. I put all of my energy components on level 1000 to release a series of particle cannons that instantly froze one of the eyes because we don't have time to deal with how vast this thing is. A weather weather cleared the skies to where we saw one of the ugliest things I've ever seen. I wanted to wake up immediately because tentacles went straight after us. Then we could hear our commander saying we should have never took matters in our own hand because they were taking satellite feeds to deal with the octopus thing that looked like a huge blob of pollution. It's right I was still frozen but taking immense damage because I was pushing the limits of my fighter jet to keep the side of it frozen even though it was big as the state of North Dakota. But I froze one of its eyes like it was nothing. I don't know how to describe whatever technology this doomsday device holds but when it's used it feels like a fairy is taking its wand and magically injecting pixie dust whenever the tip is running across my skin. Then a huge painful vibration lingers over my skin shortly after the particle cannons have to recharge. It doesn't interfere with my lifeline even though it makes me feel good more than it harms me. Squad 1 decided to go above the clouds to try a formation of severing the eye via massive laser damage but trying to figure out a way to disintegrate the monster so it doesn't plummet all the way down onto Canada. With carefully aimed precision, the outer hole of the eye was cut off, then it started falling. The other three squads immediately shot it to get rid of it. It was a success. We all breathed deeply, then went back to the offense, but the terraform was purely focused on my fighter jet as well as a swarm of angelic wyverns. Their attention forced me to leave the combat area up to 200 miles because if I hadn't have entered Mahmoud, I would have had to eject and possibly been eaten in the skies for the first time. By this time, the arms of the W had been halfway decreased and the terraform lost some of its body. I was still hundreds of miles away from freezing and destroying the terraform to keep it from regenerating to an extent. When my favorite 15-man squad from Saudi Arabia finally showed up, they said they had my back. All I had to do was drop some of my energy and the way I have in the past to change their doomsday devices for a short period of time. This was draining me, but the idea was to make them ice able so the attention would be taken from me specifically. With the 15 of them breaking the attention on me, the terraform lost half of his body but was still functioning. I was trying my damnness to eat while dodging wyvern attacks with my squad helping to fend for me. When I could finally see straight, it was all for nothing. A new species of wyverns emerged from the carcass of the terraform that was deemed inoperable. Red wyverns with devil horns and tails made of fire indicated they weren't about to ice us to death. They started zipping through the air, destroying tanks on the ground, mobile suits on the ground or in the sky, jets in the sky with black skulls emerging from their mouth as projectiles. Let me try to wake up again. Nope. Stuck in dreamland for real, but I don't want to play this game anymore. I took a deep breath and entered mock mode with my squad and with nasty precision. I was able to freeze the other half of the terraform. And then Franco finally had time to use his poison powers to immediately flesh eat all of Wyverns in range. Then the weather weather in the other section created a tornado to carry the poison through the air. We counted our blessings as these demented Wyverns from heaven and hell were disintegrating without the use of nukes. Then all Wyverns stopped, descended, and laid flat on whatever ground they were in. Half of the W remained when this started which made the weather weather stop her tornado and Franco stop producing poison. It looks like they are surrendering. They are surrendering. The white orb disappeared. A weight on my chest disappeared when Bianca said it over the radio. Then we all had that weight lifting. My squad got in a circle. Noses of our jets facing the center. We all stood up and started smiling to each other while laughing with tears of joy being swept off of our face because of the wind. It was beautiful. Till we got back to base. Our commanders ripped us a new one then for some reason they handed the rings over to us. There happened to many other people who were on the front lines that survived. Even the Saudis got pushed into higher echelon chairs of power. 
what was going on. I became a leader for disobeying command, but we did save our world and that ominous white orb finally disappeared. We watched it over and over on video while we were given a rare glass of champagne. We didn't know if the war was exactly over, but it felt like it. It was one hell of a victory, especially with the terraform being added to the mix. Its eyes looked like the end, just the end. Nothing more, nothing less. I was surprised it went down easily. I had more of a hard time dodging the angelic wyverns afterwards. What a day. Why did the battle only last a day? I asked myself that while I shaved my head that night, just so I can get back to the hangar to chill with my squad. We had a feeling that no matter how we felt about it, it could possibly not be over. We haven't gotten a message from Wyvern commanders saying that the war is over, yet we were already geared up and ready for anything that may possibly come. We fell asleep with other three sections around a barrel with a fire in it, bottles of beer scattered around with blankets covering us all. Before we finally knocked out, Everett, Franco, and I were talking about things. Things throughout the entire war. Some of the most beautiful lit skies before mayhem started with our rail guns. The many vacations we took after winning battles. Little kids abusing my thumbs up, straight face situations. Dragons and wyverns that weren't a part of the war. Our many theories about the white orb and where it could have gone next. Then we started talking about why there is no time with her. Because Franco and I want to go back in time to see our family. Everett didn't want to. He deemed it would be too painful. But home is where the heart is. It felt like I left my home with my family in another time period. Yet, it was all a dream. Just transcending universes. Every time I closed my eyes. Then I was about to close my eyes. Then a chain of events of the dream flashed before my eyes because an alarm went off.